Let's begin. Uh, welcome everyone to the post-launch uh, session on cryptography and secure storage. We have four uh, very exciting talks lined up today on subjects ranging from uh, protecting memory access patterns to securely deleting data, uh, information leaks via uh, GPUs, uh, as well as providing possible deniability for storage. Uh, first up, we have uh, Joshua Gatcher. Joshua is a second year PhD student at Cornell, and he's broadly interested in cryptography, cryptocurrencies, and formal methods. And today he'll be talking about an externally verifiable oblivious rule. All right, thank you. I am Joshua. Uh, so today I'll be talking about a new security uh, no notion for oblivious REM. This work is done in collaboration with my collaborators Adam Gross and Alex Ledger. So today, people put a lot of private data on the cloud. Of course, we don't always trust the cloud, so we have to have some way of protecting our data. So what we do, of course, is we encrypt our data files. However, as we have seen earlier today, this is not always perfect because the cloud can still learn about the indices of our data into the database, forming these things that we call access patterns. To see why this is dangerous, just to recap, consider these two access patterns seen here. On the top access pattern, the user accesses data files number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, which is consistent with the linear scan of the data. On the bottom, instead, the user accesses data files 28, 28, 28, which is not consistent with the linear scan. Thus, this shows that if the server can see the access pattern of the data, the server can infer what kind of algorithm you're using on the data, which in turn reveals a lot of semantic content. If instead, we can obfuscate the access patterns of our data, the server has a lot less information. Now, the server only basically knows how much data we have and how often we access it, which is a lot less information. Uh, fortunately, there is a standard cryptographic technique for achieving this, which is called oblivious RAM. Here's an abstract diagram of the oblivious RAM protocol. On the left, we have the user interfacing with the oblivious RAM protocol. The user gives us input, n, which is the index for, so this is for each access. So on the left, the user gives their index n, which is the index in the database they wish to access. The user also gives this data block here seen in black, which is the data block that they wish to write to the uh, database each access. On the bottom of the, of the protocol, uh, um, for the user's output, the user gets uh, this block seen here in blue, which by the security of the ORAN protocol is the true and this data block. On the right, we have the server just interfacing back and forth of the protocol, exchanging seemingly random data blocks. By the security of the ORAN protocol, the server learns nothing about the actual index of any of these data blocks. We focus in this work on two modern ORAM schemes, path and ring ORAM. Uh, for certain use cases, they're definitely um, efficient enough to use in practice. Uh, both schemes give about um, a login bandwidth blow up in the worst case. Um, so basically, now we've solved the issue of data confidentiality. However, note that integrity of this data is still a problem. The ORAM protocol basically just moves around data blocks, but has no protections about whether or not these data blocks are correct to the user. Fortunately, modern ORAM protocols are known to be compatible with standard techniques, the standard technique of Merkle trees, which is, which is um, we can use because the ORAM protocols have this natural binary tree structure to the data. Uh, here, the user stores a small constant information, which is called the root. And the output to the user is not only the end of the data block, but also a new root, root prime, along with this small log n size proof. Indeed, the user can run this algorithm, which we call check proof, which given the old root, the new root, any data that was given to the protocol, any data given back to the user, as well as the this check mark, uh, the, this algorithm will return a Boolean. This Boolean is true when integrity is preserved, which means that this new root is, corresponds to a sound update of the database given the old root and this proof. Crucially, this check proof function is only a protocol, oh, it's only a function of the ORAM transcript, which by the security of the ORAM protocol reveals no private information about the user's data. What this means is that if a third party has access to this transcript, uh, the third party can actually validate this proof itself, which means that we can have some, kind of, some form of transferability about this proof. Thus, now we have solved basically both data confidentiality and data integrity. 
However, we have not yet addressed data availability. This protocol, as it is, does not say anything about what happens if the server goes offline. And this is what we, what we try to answer. This question is what we try to answer in our work. What guarantees can we give to data availability while preserving ORM security using our protocol? First, let's define what availability means. For a server to become unavailable, it means that it's unable to follow a correct execution of the protocol. Note that this covers both non-response and also data loss because we consider checking integrity of the data as part of the correct execution of the protocol. Now, if the server goes offline, we can't actually force the server to come, off, to come back online, obviously. So what we do is the next best thing. What we try to do is compel the server to give a compensation to the client uh, in return for a lapse in availability. This compensation will come, uh, this repercussion will come from some kind of other financial agent who has some kind of financial leverage over the server. However, this financial agent cannot trust the client to witness availability, otherwise a malicious client could abuse this trust for gain. So what we do instead is have the client prove availability loss to this financial agent, which we call this external verifier. What, the, what will happen is the verifier will check the proof given to, to them by the client, and if it is good, they may then justly penalize the server. Note that, by the way, that this proof must be interactive because the verifier must be able to witness non-response of the, of the server. Note also that this external verifier is mostly acting as a deterrent for misbehavior from the server. Um, we expect this proof to only happen in the event of actual availability lapse, otherwise the protocol should proceed just as before. So now we can sketch what our protocol will look like. Um, in the average case, the optimistic case, uh, exactly as before, except the protocol will proceed exactly as before, except with a few checkpoint signatures, which are exchange each access between the client and the server. These checkpoint signatures serve as agreements uh, between the client and the server over the state of the database. Uh, what actually happens is that the signature, the signature will basically be the Merkle tree root, along with a counter, which will enforce data freshness. In the event of an availability lapse, the client will then halt the ordinary execution of the protocol. The client and server then will revert state to the most recent state agreed to by these checkpoint signatures. Now what happens is the client initiates a verified access of the protocol. In this protocol mode, the client and server will route the entire protocol through the verifier. While blind to the actual data, what the verifier now has access to is the ORAM transcript along with these checkpoint signatures seen here and here. Using the transcript, the verifier can then check semantic correctness of the protocol both for the client and the server. Recall before that uh, integrity checking can be done by a third party if they have access to the transcript. And also these checkpoint signatures can be seen to be easily publicly verifiable. If any party, uh, while running the ORAM transcript, ORAM protocol, uh, violates any semantic correctness properties or times out, the verifier now can count this as a failure of that party. At the end of the access, the verifier will output either OK, cheat S, or cheat C. Cheat S means that the misbehavior of the server has been detected by the verifier. Similarly, cheat C means that the client has somehow misbehaved. Of course, what we want is that if the client is honest and the server has experienced some sort of failure, uh, the verifier will output cheat S. Similarly, if the server is honest and the client is dishonest, the verifier will output cheat C. Recall this, this might happen because we want to protect the server in the case that the client is malicious. Otherwise, the verifier will output OK. Uh, this can legitimately happen if there's a failure which the client detects, but it is too short to be picked up by the verifier. Um, in a nutshell, our security claim, or our security requirement for the protocol, is that security holds whenever a malicious client cannot force cheat S. And similarly for the server, a malicious server cannot force cheat C to happen. Uh, this security definition is formalized in our paper as, a, as an ideal functionality, cryptographic ideal functionality. Um, this set of properties here is collectively what we call external verifiability. Note, however, that this verifier is trusted for correctness, but not security. What, what this means is that the security must if the verifier is correct, the security definition will hold, but maybe not if the, security is inc if the verifier is incorrect. However, 
the ORAM transcript can be trusted to be completely public, which means that the verifier doesn't actually need to hold any secret state. In our paper, we give the security definition for externally verifiable ORAM, called EV ORAM. We give EV ORAM extensions to both path and ring ORAM. And along the way, we also give a novel integrity checking scheme for ring ORAM. This is subtle because ring ORAM does not strictly adhere to this binary tree structure, which I alluded to earlier. Now we can talk about implementation. Uh, in our implementation, the interesting thing here is that the verifier can actually be implemented as an Ethereum smart contract, which moves this protocol back from a three-person protocol to a two-person protocol, effectively. So I will talk about how that happens. Ethereum is a massively distributed consensus protocol, which maintains a notion of currency as in Bitcoin, but also maintains a notion of smart contracts. Smart contracts are essentially programs which are executed as part of the consensus protocol. By the security of the consensus protocol, we get that these programs can be trusted to be executed correctly. Here it's just a small schematic of what it means to be a smart contract. Over here we have an end user interfacing with a smart contract which is collectively executed by all the members of the Ethereum blockchain. Since uh, this smart contract is collectively executed by all of these members, it must be that the contract must have some kind of public state. There's no secret state that this contract can have. This contract, um, in addition to performing arbitrary computations, can also hold and manipulate the currency maintained by Ethereum itself. So thus, we, this is why we actually call it a contract, because that can actually enforce some kind of financial capabilities. Um, additionally, assuming that the Ethereum blockchain is still running and that you connect, can connect to it, you can assume that these contracts are available. There's no reason that these contracts would time out if the Ethereum blockchain isn't running as normal. Of course, the punchline here is that these four properties are exactly the same programming model as our verifier, which means that the, our verified access, as talked about before, can actually be run where the verifier is itself a smart contract on the Ethereum blockchain. Now we'll talk a little bit about implementation. Um, we implement our client and server code for the ORAM protocol locally, as well as the verifier in 300, about 300 lines of solidity, which is the scripting language for Ethereum smart contracts. The bottlenecks for these kinds of systems is, of course, caused by the blockchain itself. Um, the time for each access, so what happens in the Ethereum network is that there is this notion of uh, time called blocks, which are emitted about once every 15 seconds. Whenever I send a message to the blockchain, this message actually has to wait for the next block to attach itself to. These blocks are, uh, come very slowly, which means that there's actually a lot of latency in these kinds of systems. Our protocol has six messages total, which means that if each message is taking about every 10 or 20 seconds, that it can run for maybe a minute and a half, which is not very good. Another issue with smart contracts is that contracts, yes, sorry. Oh. Another issue with smart contracts is that um, they cost currency for themselves to execute. Uh, as of when we wrote the paper, uh, for a simulated 10 terabyte database access, uh, it only cost 33 cents for this contract to execute. However, as Ethereum became more valuable over time, this, this price actually skyrocketed to $15, which is less than practical. Uh, what this shows is that scalability of, while this is an interesting idea, scalability of smart contract systems is still a major open area. Now I'll just wrap up by mentioning a few further directions. What we essentially do in this paper is extend ORAM by adding a minimal amount of information, which we call an audit trail, which can be verifiably, which can be externally verified by a third party. Of course, this methodology can probably be extended to other protocols, such as secure multi-party computation or protocols of outsourced computation and so on. Um, Another thing we talk about, uh, another thing which would be interesting for the research is more efficient use of these smart contracts. Um, crypt, uh, conventional crypto papers don't really talk about uh, the case where we have a very, very limited uh, execution environment as, a, as in a smart contract, which it brings up inter interesting notions about computation costs and also around complexity. Uh, so if you're interested in this work, I invite you to look at my, look at my code here and um, see if there's anything you would like to see in it. I would note that this 
might be interesting to you if you're interested in smart contract programming in general, not just ORAM stuff, because there's a lot in here that you could learn just for the smart contracts in generally. Thank you.